Let's talk about Charles Taylor for a moment. He was a very prominent person in Liberia, obviously the president, and very well known in Africa and around the world. What role did he play in Sierra Leone? What was he doing in Sierra Leone? Well, of course, at, at, at this stage, we have presented our evidence against Charles Taylor. We, uh, beginning in January of 2008, we've called witnesses uh, to The Hague. We've presented now 91 total uh, prosecution witnesses and have concluded our, our, the, that testimony, uh, including 31 sort of linkage witnesses that link Charles Taylor to the crimes in, in Sierra Leone. Uh, many people from Liberia will talk about Charles Taylor and what he did in Liberia. And, and that may be relevant to a point in showing a pattern of conduct, but our court can only deal with his responsibility for Sierra Leone and only during the periods of 1996 to 2002. Uh, but the evidence that we presented uh, shows that, that he was um, effectively the leader of the rebels uh, and that he made decisions about what the rebels were going to do. Uh, they, they called him, they, they called him chief, and uh, he provided them with arms and material and training in return. He was able to exploit the diamonds of, of Sierra Leone, uh, indeed, uh, profit in, in, in that transaction. Some of those diamonds used for, for resupply of their arms, uh, but some for, for, his, for his own uh, uses. And uh, we presented uh, testimony uh, about uh, that those allegations supporting uh, the ARP case uh, and, and many people that were ta close to Taylor in the past, uh, most prominently his vice president, the man who succeeded him as president, Moses Blah, testified in May uh, 2008. I personally led his testimony in the trial, but also have included other people uh, from his corps of bodyguards uh, uh, to a person that was allegedly head of his death squad, to people involved in communications, uh, uh, diamond transactions, uh, uh, people uh, uh, in the rebel army of, of, of Sierra Leone uh, who, who can testify to the contacts that they had with Taylor and, and his lieutenant. So that's the, that's the key testimony to show the connection. Of course, we've also had to prove that the crimes were committed. We've charged him with 11 uh, counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes, from murder to mutilation to use of child soldiers to pillage to sexual slavery and rape. Uh, all of these uh, as, as, as war crimes or crimes against humanity so that they're international crimes, uh, but we've had to prove that those crimes were, took place and that these rebel units are responsible, but then we have to show Charles Taylor responsible for those rebel units. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned war crimes, crimes against humanity, and didn't mention mm -hmm. genocide, but we'll mm -hmm. bring that in. And of course, that's sort of the tripod for the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. And the International Criminal Court was established by the United Nations in 2002. It's separate from the UN to a large degree today. But what is the role of the International Criminal Court as opposed to your special tribunal in Sierra Leone? What exactly, uh, how do you interact with the International Criminal Court or would the International Criminal Court be handling this if your particular operation had not been established. Okay. Well, I understand the United Nations beginning in 93 has been involved in establishing uh, courts for special mm -hmm. ICE situations for certain territories and certain time periods beginning with Yugoslavia and then to Rwanda and then to our court and there's some other hybrid institutions even reaching back to the Cambodian genocide of the 70s that have, that have resulted in the establishment of courts. Um, and, and each of them uh, basically are tasked with enforcing international law as it existed at that time. And there is a whole body of international law. There's the Genocide Convention. There are the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols. There's the customary law of crimes against humanity, which were prosecuted at Nuremberg. So there is a body of law that's out there. National authorities often have the power to do that, but often don't have the capacity or willingness to do it. The UN can come along and establish a court to to enforce that international law in a very specific kind of situation, and usually it's been the Security Council, which requires relative you know, unanimity, it's certainly no veto for many of the permanent five for, for those kinds of things to go forward. The International Criminal Court was a, was a treaty-based court established, sponsored by the United Nations uh, at the beginning, the conferences that, that, that brought about its creation, but basically a treaty that took these, the Genocide Convention and the Crimes Against Humanity and, and War Crimes and, and listed them and, and sent this treaty out for ratification. It's now been ratified by 108 countries. Once there were 60 ratifications in July of 2002, it came into effect, but only with the power to prosecute cases after July of 2002. So these things that happened in the 90s, the ICC couldn't deal with if it wanted to. 
and the ICC, of course, generally only deals with cases in countries that have ratified or where the nationals of those countries that have ratified uh, are accused of the crimes. Uh, the exception to that, which has occurred in Sudan Darfur, is where the Security Council of the United Nations, operating in to some extent the same sort of way they operated when they established these short-term courts, says, Mr. ICC prosecutor, we want you to take this one and by a nine-vote majority with no, uh, with no veto, uh, sends that to the ICC. That's the one place where there's that direct uh, referral. But generally, uh, the cases only arise in, in places where, uh, where there's ratification. You're watching Global Connections Television, and the main purpose of Global Connections TV is to focus attention on international issues that impact people from Frankfurt, Kentucky to Frankfurt, Germany, and from Lima, Ohio to Lima, Peru. We also try to take a look at the United Nations and the role that the UN agencies play in dealing with the majority, if not all, of these international problems. My guest today is focusing on an international problem that is of tremendous interest to especially people in Sierra Leone, but also to people throughout Africa and around the world. He is looking at the crimes against humanity and war crimes that were, were, cre that were uh, developed during the civil war that took place in Sierra Leone. Mr. Steve Rapp is an American lawyer and has been the chief prosecutor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone since December of 2006. Originally, Mr. Rapp is, was a Democratic member of the Iowa House of Representatives, and he's been involved in a wide range of tribunals, especially in Rwanda over the past several years. We were talking about Sierra Leone and the horrific actions that took place back during the Civil War, and the Civil War went on for quite a while, and many, many people were adversely affected by it, uh, tens of thousands killed, and out of this we've seen certain, I think, symbols, and one is the child soldier that you mentioned earlier. We had a clip on that. This was one of the other things that came out of this particular situation was how often people lost limbs. When I think of the civil wars that have taken place around Africa and other parts of the world, so many of them took place and there were, there were a lot of atrocities that were committed, uh, just horrible, despicable things were done, but a lot of the children in particular lost limbs. Do, does that come in, do you discuss that in your, when you're listening to the testimony from various people and, and talking to them? And what are some of the most moving arguments or stories that you've heard up to this point? Well, there was our last witness, the 91st witness that testified in the Charles Taylor trial. Uh, he's a double amputee, uh, lost both his limbs. And, and uh, what happened in his case, and it happened just after the uh, invasion of Freetown in January of 99, is that the rebels uh, found him hiding. Uh, they dragged him and his, and his family out and, uh, and, and ordered him to put his, his, his hand, his left hand out, and they chopped off his, his left hand. And uh, then his little boy, who was four years old, uh, cried, Papa, don't do that to my Papa, don't do that to my Papa. And they said, bring that boy here. And they brought the boy forward, and they were going to chop off his hand, too. And the father then put his right hand out and said, take my second hand, save my son. And, and they chopped off his second hand. And, and since then, uh, his, his, his son is, is with him. Uh, he was four then, he's 14 now. Uh, as he said, his, his son is his hands. Uh, he helps him feed, helps him, you know, go to the bathroom and, and everything else. And he was, he was with him, uh, escorting him uh, and taking care of, of, uh, of his father uh, in The Hague. During, and, uh, I mean, a very uh, affecting kind of t uh, testimony, but there you, you had such a contrast in, in the courtroom between this person who, who sacrificed his own hands for the future of his son and, and, and the accused, uh, Charles Taylor, who's, who's alleged to have uh, sacrificed the lives, the hands, the futures of, of thousands of, of men, women, and children uh, in pursuit of, of his own uh, power and wealth. And, and that's the kind of contrast that we present in, in, in the courtroom. Uh, but certainly this, this business of amputating hands, I mean, people have a hard time understanding what, what was that all about? Why would they do such a thing? And particularly, there were a lot of children who were amputated, even babies that were amputated. I mean, what, what, it, it makes no sense to a lot of people. And it, Indeed, it didn't make sense to me when, when, I, when I came upon it, but uh, initially it, it, it occurred when the rebels were trying to stop an election, and the president, uh, the, who was uh, the person that was ahead in the election, had, had said, uh, uh, you know, let's join hands for the future of Sierra Leone. And I said, well, if that's the way he is, we'll start chopping off hands and say, if you want your hands, you can go to the, go to the president. But it was a way to, in, in their view, to obstruct an election in which, they, uh, in which their demands uh, hadn't been met. Prior to, prior to that time.